I'm Patricia Vallone with the CTV News Update. Thanks for joining us. Montgomery County families who say they've lost loved ones due to alleged police brutality are calling for change in the county and throughout the state. Keisha Butts covered a protest where they gathered in front of the White Oak Police Station this morning. Advocates against police brutality gathered at the White Oak Police Station calling for reform in Montgomery County. They united with family members who say their loved ones were allegedly assaulted or killed by officers. A friend thought he was potentially suicidal and called 911. The police came to our house. They, I was upstairs asleep and um, they, uh, he went outside with them to talk. The next thing I know, he's screaming. I run outside. There's two police officers on top of him. Uh, he's handcuffed and face down on the ground. A mobile crisis unit would have been much better response. Our communities are not just demanding transparency, accountability, justice, but a fundamental change to a system that continues to dehumanize, that continues to brutalize, and to continue to devalue black and brown residents, not just in Montgomery County, but across this state and across this country. Today we're here to basically say that the reforms that have come out from the county so far and the um, discussion has not been enough. We're hoping to um, really pressure the county to start defunding police and start investing in communities. The Montgomery County Council is expected to hold a hearing later tonight that could create new regulations for police use of force. This is Keisha Butts with CTV News. The Montgomery County Council is holding the hearing on police excessive use of force tonight at 7.30. A metro train derails at the Silver Spring Station this morning. Firefighters evacuated a conductor and passenger. Officials say customers should expect red line delays in both directions. Shuttle bus service is being provided for impacted riders. Well, Maryland health officials report an increase in confirmed COVID-19 cases. 492 people have tested positive for the virus in the last 24 hours. This brings the state's total cases to more than 70,000. Meantime, the Maryland death toll stands at 3,140. Maryland's Legislative Latino Caucus calls on Governor Hogan to help undocumented residents who are ineligible for federal aid during the pandemic crisis. According to Maryland Matters, lawmakers sent a letter to Hogan noting that Langley Park has the highest coronavirus rate in the state. Advocates say many residents have been hit hard by numerous factors, including living in multi-generational homes, which are often small apartments, and facing more risk of exposure because of the inability to work from home. The caucus letter also warns of an impending homeless crisis when the ban on evictions ends. As gyms across the region begin to reopen, many are having to remake themselves during the pandemic. Gold's Gym in Bowie has moved some of its equipment and classes outdoors to prevent possible exposure to COVID-19. It comes on the heels of more than 200 scientists warning the World Health Organization of airborne transmission of the virus. The scientists say that there is increasing evidence the coronavirus can stay in the air longer and be more harmful indoors than previously thought. A Maryland biotech company has been awarded a $1.6 billion contract to develop a coronavirus vaccine. Officials with Gaithersburg-based Norvax say the company will conduct late-stage trials and secure 100 million doses of vaccine once it's developed. Company officials say they expect to have doses ready by late this year or early 2021 if clinical trial data shows it's safe and effective. Could D.C.'s area football team change its name before the start of the NFL season? If so, the move couldn't come fast enough for some of Maryland's indigenous population. It's not something that someone can say that someone had another definitional opinion about this name. It is what it is. For 25 years, Native Americans had fought in court to cancel the D.C. football team's trademark, saying it was disparaging to the indigenous population. For Piscataway Elder Rico Newman, it's been personal. Maybe 10 years ago, I had spoken with a delegate who was absolutely amazed to find out that Maryland still had in its regulations or its laws from the colonial period for the, what the payment would be for scouts. 
and that those scalps had to come with flesh and red skin. Not long ago, owner Dan Snyder vowed to never give up the name. But many insiders now say change is inevitable thanks to the Black Lives Matter movement and its quest to rid the country of disparaging mementos. As sponsors pull merchandise from shelves, the team now says it will review its name. You've asked for it to be removed, to be changed for many, many years, and even brought it to court, and it hasn't happened. What's changing now? Money. <laughs> Newman says it's all about the bottom dollar. That it can't be just about what's happening with one ethnicity and not consider what is happening with another. So it's got to have some impact on the Native Americans, on the issues that impact on them, as well as it is with the African American community, the Asian community, etc. Uh, but again, it took until it became dollars and cents that people were starting to give some sense toward looking at it and understanding the impact, the negative impact that it has on our community. Legal and branding experts say it would be difficult and highly unlikely to execute a name change before the season is set to begin. Prince William County Public Schools will be changing the names of two schools named after a Confederate general. Stonewall Middle School and Stonewall Jackson High School will be known as Unity Braxton and Unity Reed. Unity Braxton has been named in honor of two trailblazers who lived in Manassas. The late Celestine Braxton was one of the first black teachers in Prince William County, where she taught for more than 30 years, including time at Stonewall Middle School. Carol Braxton was one of the country's first black Marines. He served in World War II in Korea, and in 2012 was awarded a Congressional Medal of Honor. How does it make you feel now to have a school that will bear your name and your wife's name? Well, I would say, fine, but really it hasn't sunk in real good yet. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Think about a school being named after, after my wife and I. Then sometimes you think about the uh, repercussion of being named after this school after so many years. And, you know, people will be thinking of Blacks being named after this white school. It was unbelievable because, you know, I grew up in the shadow of the Battle of Bull Run in Manassas, Virginia. Mm. So the Confederacy has always been an influencing aspect of growing up in that community. So, I mean, I'm just, I'm tickled. You know, I'm, I'm glad that my dad is alive to see it. Chevrolet leaders are voicing concerns about the proposed site of a new Amazon delivery station. The site, which would be located in the 5800 block of Columbia Park Road, would require the construction of a collector road and could add additional traffic to the area. The facility would allow tractor trailer trucks to bring in packages from larger warehouses for pickup and delivery by Amazon vans. Town leaders want to delay a preliminary hearing on the plan scheduled for July 16th. Well, seven children all under the age of five have died in hot cars this year. That according to AAA. The Auto Club is asking parents to, quote, look before you lock and make sure that you don't leave your child behind. 53 kids died of vehicle heat stroke last year. Well, we may be in for another round of thunderstorms and heavy rain tonight. The National Weather Service says the storms could bring damaging winds and possible flash flooding. Downtown Upper Marlboro near the courthouse is prone to flooding. This scene is from early this afternoon, hours after heavy rains last night. Fire officials have responded to three high water rescue calls since the overnight. They are reminding motorists to avoid high water areas. Hi everybody, welcome to the CTV Sports page. Tonight we are talking tennis. The 2020 ATP Tour will come back online in August and they will do so right here in Washington, D.C. at the City Open. We're thrilled that the tennis world's gonna restart in Washington at the City Open this summer. Um, it's been an extraordinary couple months trying to overcome a lot of obstacles uh, and develop a comprehensive plan that would make everyone feel safe 
while they're at the event. And we're just really grateful for the collaboration with a huge amount of people and organizations that have gotten us to where we are today. Given this is the first tour uh, event back, what kind of players can we expect to see in Washington this summer? We think we're going to have an extraordinary player field. We've already seen the sign-up list and the uh, incoming calls and emails from agents and players. Uh, you know, if you're going to go play the U.S. Open and Cincinnati played in New York, um, it just seems like it makes all the sense in the world to start a week before in Washington, D.C. It's just as easy to fly into our city. You get a week of competition under your belt, get a chance to compete. Um, get to earn some money, some ranking points. And I think that's the way most players are looking at it. So we think it's going to be an unbelievable field. In years past, it's been a dual event with the ATP and the WTA. Is that going to be the case again this year? We're working really hard to uh, find a way to do the WTA and event in a way that makes sense. Uh, you know, I think you're aware that there are actually different level events. Um, and so they have very different economic structures, commitments, and other things. Um, and we've been working collaboration with the WTA, Octagon, that actually owns the sanction, to try to find a way to, to do it. And we're really hopeful. We're committed to having women there. Hopefully it's through with hosting the tournament. But if not, you know, some form of uh, competitive playing opportunity for a bunch of uh, women players. So we, uh, we're working really hard on it. The City Open gets underway on August 14th from Rock Creek Park in Washington, D.C. Still no word on if fans will be allowed in to watch these events. Moving on to baseball, the 2020 schedule was released last night. The Washington Nationals will open up the 2020 season on July 23rd when they host the New York Yankees at Nationals Park. The Baltimore Orioles will open up their 2020 campaign on the road. They will be in Boston to take on the Red Sox. Their home opener will be on July 29th when they host the Miami Marlins. And as of right now, there will not be fans in the stands for Major League Baseball. And that is your CTV Sports Report. And that wraps up CTV News for now. Join us again tomorrow at 4.30. Have a great evening. For the latest information on COVID-19 in Maryland, visit the State Health Department website. That's health.maryland.gov. Again, health.maryland.gov. Click the link to the COVID-19 information portal. There you'll find all the latest information about coronavirus. You'll find daily updates on cases and fatalities. Answers to questions about testing and the governor's stay-at-home order are available as well. For specific information about Prince George's, visit PrinceGeorgesCountyMD.gov. That's PrinceGeorgesCountyMD.gov. The site offers information about local services for residents and businesses. There's a link for COVID-19 relief donations. Also, food pantry locations are listed. And if you have any questions, call the county COVID-19 hotline at 301-883-6627. That's 301-883-6627. Here are your AARP top tips on caregiver preparedness during coronavirus. First, form a caregiving team. Create a list of people in your family and friend network who can help with caregiving tasks. Take an inventory of supplies in your loved one's home. Try to have a two-week supply of essential items. Make a list of the care recipient's medications and medical contacts. Be sure to have prescriptions on hand and ask the pharmacist for an extra 30-day supply. Make a plan to stay connected. To prevent social isolation, set up available technology to help loved ones stay connected and schedule regular chats. Finally, maintain your own self-care. Follow the Centers for Disease Control's guidelines for coronavirus safety. And have a backup plan for care in case you become ill. For more caregiving tips during the coronavirus pandemic, go to aarp.org caregiving.